good morning to you. Thanks for being with me as part of today's service. Today, we're going to be starting a short series on Advent, and I've got two talks just as we get towards Christmas. And the passages I'm going to be looking at today are kind of two passages together, really. And it's Isaiah 9, verses 2 to 7, and Matthew 4, verses 12 to 17, as you've heard uh, from our reading. So those are the two passages, Old and New Testament, of course. And the title for today is A Light Has Dawned. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much that in all the circumstances we go through, you remain who you are. You are King, you are Lord, you are the Majesty, the Messiah, the Great One sent from the Father into our world. And you rose again from the dead that we might have life. Praise you for this Advent time as we think about the coming of Christ again. Please bless your word to us, we ask, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, first of all, a little bit of history, really, which is relevant to the Isaiah 9 passage. I'm sure all of us have heard of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, three of those tribes, Zebulun, Asher and Naphtali, were the three tribes that were based in the area in the land of Canaan in the region of Galilee. And in Joshua chapter 9, in the book of Joshua, you'll read about the very first accounts of those tribes and that particular land. But with those tribes moving into that land, they never really got rid of the Canaanite inhabitants. There was always a kind of mixed set of beliefs, mixed people groups, and kind of mixed ideas and teachings and views in that particular land. So it's a very mixed area. That's the word, mixed. It works well for what we're saying today and worth remembering for later on. As we fast forward now to the time of Isaiah, which is the 8th century, we find that Assyria, that massive country, Assyria had engulfed the land of Galilee, that land where the three tribes were first found. They'd engulfed that particular region. And what happened was the greater part of the population of Galilee was then taken away and exiled into the land of Assyria and assimilated into that population there. But what then had happened is other strangers, other groups had moved into the land of Galilee where those persons had been. So there really was a huge amount of foreign blood, you could say, in that Galilean area. Therefore, from Isaiah's time, it was largely in Gentile, not Jewish hands. And that's important to remember as well. So on every side, there were Gentiles. In fact, the word Galilee comes from a word meaning circle. So simply, they were encircled by non-Jews. So it's quite an interesting little fact there, which really helps us to understand what it was like at that time. Now, here's some other things which is, which is really important. Galilee also had incredibly rich soil, brilliant place for planting and growing things, very fertile, beautifully fertile. So what would happen, as you'd expect, many people would move there from all over the place because the place was so good for farming and those kind of things, so bringing up a family, that sort of stuff. And the roads and the traffic, so to speak, all passed through Galilee, which is why it was said, Galilee is on the way to everywhere, which is quite a good phrase really, but it it serves a purpose and it shows us how busy that area was. Galilee therefore was a densely populated area. And for its size, it had a huge amount of people in it. 
and with it came, here we go again, as you'd expect, lots of people all moving into the area, it, there came with it a massive, huge mixture of ideas and beliefs and teachings. And that meant that those persons in that area was very open to new ideas and new views and new teachings. I used the word mixed a few moments ago, right at the beginning of this talk, and I said, let's try and remember it. Well, here we are, we can see why. Because historically, Galilee is, is this particular area where it's always been mixed. That's its historicity, all sorts of views and teachings and so on. So that's really important because as we shall see in a few moments, that's gonna make a lot of uh, an insight into what I've got to share with you. So what a hodgepodge, what a place. What should one believe? God's plan is this, that for Asher, Zebulun, Galilee, and Naphtali, God's plan is a light upon you has dawned. Galilee of the Gentiles, the land encircled by the Gentiles and full of Gentiles, upon you a light has come. You who are in death are now able to come into life. You who are in darkness are now able to come into the light. You have seen a great light. And what light is that? Matthew makes it clear. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is their light. Years of mixed beliefs, years of new ideas, mixtures this way and the other, they are about to be cleared up. They are about to be straightened up because the light, Jesus Christ, has come. It's interesting, isn't it? The first thing Jesus did in his ministry was to go to Galilee. He'd just gone through the temptation with the devil and out of it he comes and he goes straight to Galilee. At the very start of his ministry, that is where he goes, into the place open to new ideas, into a place receptive of spiritual things. That is where he went, and he went because they so needed him. And he went as a Jew. Let's not forget, Jesus was a Jew and he went as a Jew. But this time, because of who he was, he went as a Jew who fulfilled Judaism. One chapter later from our passage today, Matthew 5, 17, makes it clear Jesus didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but fulfill them. So into the land of Galilee, he went. He went because the people needed a light and he went to make a difference to their lives that they might be straightened out. But the question is, why would Jesus be this important? He's this important because he is the one who fulfills ancient prophecies. Back in Isaiah 9, it is clear that these words were spoken to this very land. But it was not until when Jesus came in Matthew 4 that these words actually came true. So Jesus is the light because... For unto us a child is born, and the government will be upon his shoulders. The government of the kingdom of God will be upon the baby who was born. After all, the kingdom is near in this person called Jesus, according to Matthew 4.17. He's also known as the wonderful counsellor. And you know, that word wonderful in the Hebrew literally means not of this world. How about that for a new take that I found today on the word wonderful? And I think also the word counsellor, to me at least, implies that he would be able to apply his knowledge to the governing task of being the king of his kingdom. Indeed, as the mighty God, he will be the divine being on earth. As father, he will reign over his children 
with a fatherliness of love and care. And he will do this with an everlasting faithfulness. How important is that to know in a culture where many don't have real mums or dads in that proper sense? He is the everlasting father with perpetuity and continuity. And he's also the prince of peace, the prince of shalom. Shalom meaning, of course, more broadly, wholeness, harmony and completion. That's who this Jesus is. He's the one who is the light, as we've seen. But this is why he is, because he is all these things. But also, and we touched on this a minute ago, he is the King Messiah, the Messiah King, who sits on an eternal throne, King David's throne. He fulfills all those ancient promises as well. And justice and righteousness will be the hallmarks of his amazing kingdom. And logically, and obviously you could say, his government will never end. How could it? It's figuratively out to the utmost farthest border, endless and infinite. How will this all be so? The zeal of the Lord Almighty, Yahweh of hosts, the God with armies of heaven, he will achieve it. It's his zeal that will do it. And interestingly, the word zeal has a relationship to the idea of jealousy and envy, a godly kind of envy and jealousy. And so therefore it means God has a zealous passion to make all this so. He has that jealous envy within him that this is what he wants. He wants to be that God to people because he knows that he is the kind of God people really do need, whether they realise it or not. This is his eternal plan. And all this is so because Jesus is all this. So he fulfills it, the whole lot. Isn't that amazing to think this one man did and is all of this? So what great news it is for Galilee, for a light did indeed dawn on them. What might God be saying to us today through these things? I'm sure you'd agree with me that to have such a high view of Jesus Christ is radically transformative. You know, when people think of Jesus at this time of year, we, we know, we've said this before, they, they think of him as this little baby in a manger. But if they're not very careful, the sentimentality of that can cause them to miss who this Jesus really is. It's so important we have a high view, so we've got a high something to say to the world. The word Advent, as I'm sure you know, is a Latin word, and it's equivalent to the Greek word parousia, which I know we've heard in recent weeks through the End Times talks that I've been doing. And it means arrival. It means coming. It means that Jesus comes with all the essence of who he really is into this world as a king, as a sovereign, entering his land. It's about the one who emits his own light into the darkness. That's who Jesus is. That's the high view that we must hold on to. We cannot let him be seen as this little baby in a manger per se, but to recognise he grew up and was always these things that I've been saying today. Because that's what Advent really is all about. It's he who has come. And it's so important we don't let go of that. And you know, this Jesus, he's the one who went into an area that any upstanding Jew could not handle, couldn't stomach it really. Why? Because the heart of God is that none will be lost and every single one of them matters to him. If I'm honest, being someone who talks about the end times quite a bit, you know, I think it's very easy for me and maybe it's easy for you 
to kind of overemphasize the future and the end times when Jesus comes back to the neglect of the present. I think we all know how hard life is. And it's easy, I think, to perhaps getting a, get into a mindset where we don't really bother to make as much of a difference in the present that we could. Because we think, well, heaven's coming, Jesus is coming back, this world is doomed. So why, why would we bother? But, you know, whilst I can really understand that and I can appreciate that and I have also taught only very recently that this world is not going to last it's not going to be renewed it will end I think we have got to be careful that that is not all we believe because if we do I think we get a misemphasis in our theology because you see Jesus is the one who knew the world was going to finally end one day the one who taught all this stuff about the end times and yet in the here and the now and in the present he radically encountered people and so I think it's really important we do not neglect the present because of our future views because Jesus died for people in the here and now because he wanted to save people in the here and now. And praise God, he rose again. We often say about Jesus' second coming, but Jesus is always coming by his spirit. And I think sometimes we don't recognise that or notice that because it's not necessarily experientially true. But I believe by his Holy Spirit, he is always present to us and can work in this world. You see, Jesus doesn't have power just when he returns. He has power right now, in the here and now, through his spirit to do incredible things. So it's important we keep that in our hearts and our minds because the church needs to operate through that belief and with that expectation. Maybe I can just say these things. The 2020 Advent Christ still has light. The 2020 Advent Christ still dispels darkness. The 2020 Perusia Christ still brings life and, dark and dispels the darkness. The 2020 Perusia Christ is still wonderful counsellor and mighty God. He's still the everlasting father and the prince of Shalom. Jesus is still Messiah now with an endless kingdom of justice and mercy. And because he has come, may I say this, the light is no longer just for Asher, but for Aldwick. The light is no longer for Naphtali, but for New Haven. The light is no longer for Zebulun, but for Zena, which is in Cornwall. I had to look that one up. And, you know, he has come. It's no longer for Galilee, but for Great Britain. It's not just for Galilee. It's for our geography anywhere in the world, because he is the Jesus who died for Jew and Gentile alike. You know, People really found it hard to cope with Galilee. If they were an upstanding Jew, as I said earlier, they really found the place hard to manage and cope with. But you know what? Wherever it is in the world today, in the places perhaps we most dislike and struggle with, the heart of God is for them as well. My friends, Great Britain, I think you'd agree, has so many mixed up ideas but the message is still the same to whoever may listen, that the way to get their ideas straightened out and cleared out is to do what Jesus said, and that is repent. For the kingdom of God is near in him, Matthew 4, 17. That's the message people need to hear. That's the message we need to live out and not just say that things might get straightened up for the glory of him, walking no longer that way, but this way on the path that God really has for them. So church, let it be that this Advent, 
we really do say some things and live out some things that are going to help the people we know come to Jesus just a bit more. You see, whether they realise it or not, they are actually relying on you and me because we are the ones with the truth and we are the ones with the light of Christ. So let us recognise afresh this day that Advent is a special, powerful time because Christ is coming to people again this year in some way. Let's try and make sure we are part of it. God bless you and thank you for your time as ever. Amen. Well, as we come to our communion part of today's service, I'd just like to read that key verse that we were looking at earlier. Matthew 4.16 reads, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You know, as I think about this and I think about our world, our society, and I think of the troubles, the difficulties, the death, the darkness, spiritually, physically, I want to have a few moments today where we pray for Great Britain, where we pray that something of the light of Christ might dawn that people might be able to say, a light has come to me, and it will be Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. I want us to pray about that for a few moments today. I also would like to think about perhaps ourselves. Some of us are going through difficulties, of course, and we just need something of the light of Jesus today too. So let's have a few moments praying that the light would dawn on society, on our country, on our churches, and indeed on us. Jesus, light of the world. Jesus, the light who has overcome the darkness. Let's pray for a few minutes, shall we? Jesus said, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Micah 7 reads, though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Psalm 18, you Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. And that famous verse, Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Jesus, light of the world. Father, today we lift our country to you. We lift the things we see in our country to you. And we say, what Great Britain needs is Jesus the real Jesus, as defined by the Bible. And we would pray, Lord, most earnestly that his, he would come and his light would shine. It would shine in the churches, shine in our lives, that we might be able to say increasingly, a light has dawned. I'm just going to switch my lights on. I guess a bit of symbolism 
But what a difference and what a difference the Lord Jesus Christ makes. We so need him and we so need his powerful, shining light of his person that gives life to people instead of the death that they know. Hallelujah. Because on that night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in memory of me. Shall we do that now together? And that same night he was betrayed, he took the cup, which was full of wine. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Drink this in memory of me. Father, we're so grateful for the broken body of your son and his shed blood. As we take these emblems, these symbols of all that you did, May we be a people who allow your life and your light to shine more greatly in us that we might be witnesses to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being part of this service with me today. And I hope that the, the worship, the word and this communion has been a special time for you as it has been for me. God bless you. Amen.